Hello, fourth grade, and welcome to unit six, week three. We're going to begin with our vocabulary words. Your first word is the word converted. When, you can, when something is converted, that means it has been changed. That means you're either changing the state that it's in or you're changing the way that it's being used. So we can say we converted sunlight into solar power or we converted wind into wind power. Next, we have the word consequences. Consequences are the results of actions. So they can be good or they can be bad. They're not necessarily strictly bad. A consequence is what happens because something else. Next, we have the word installed. When something's been installed, that means we put it in place to be used. So you can install a fan, like a ceiling fan in your living room. You can install uh, a new refrigerator in your kitchen, or you can install something like new software on your computer. So you're putting it there. It has a purpose to be used for something. Next, we have the word coincidence. Events that happen at the same time by chance are coincidence. So something, two things that happen or a couple things that happen at the same time that, that weren't planned um, are called a coincidence. So if you get to school and you and your best friend are wearing the same t-shirt and you didn't plan it, that's a coincidence. Or if you ran into your cousin at the store and you weren't planning on seeing them that day, that's a coincidence as well. Next, we have the word incredible. Something that is incredible is impossible or hard to believe. You can't believe it. So our example sentence here says, scientists have incredible new ways to use solar power. So things that are almost impossible to believe because they're so great. Our next word is the word efficient. Something that is efficient uh, does work in a way where it doesn't waste effort. It doesn't waste energy. It doesn't waste power. So if you have um, an efficient washing machine, for example, at home. That means that washing machine doesn't use a lot of water. It uses just as much as it needs to get your clothes clean. It doesn't use a lot of electricity. It's not on for a very long time, right? So it's, it helps to conserve energy and reduce waste. Next, we have the word consume. When you consume something, you're using it up. Either you're consuming it by, like, for example, your car will consume gas if you're using it, you're driving around a lot, or your electronics will consume electricity, or you might consume your food. Anything that's being used up or eaten up is being consumed. And our last word is the word renewable. Renewable means something that will replace itself or something that can be grown again or restored. So renewable energy is like solar power, right? We, the sun comes up every day or wind energy. Uh, bamboo, because it grows quickly and it grows a lot, uh, is a renewable source of fibers that people use for things even like clothing. Our spelling words this week are going to focus on prefixes. Now, we've already talked about all of these prefixes, so think about how they change the meaning of the base word that they're attached to as you read through them. Discourage, disappoint, disbelief, distrust, disloyal misplace, mislabel, mislead, misstep, misnumber, non-fact, non-fiction, nonsense, non-stop, unable, unplug, uncertain, uncomfortable, uncover, unclean, print, wade, boulder, mishap, and unravel. Now for our language arts notes, we're going to be starting something new today. And we're going to be talking about things that are called negatives. A negative is a statement or a word that means no. So it can mean no or the opposite of something. So if a statement has a form of the word be, now we talked about these before, forms of the word be are is, am, are, was, or were, or forms of the word have, like have, has, or had, we're going to add the word not to make them a negative. So we write this as a contraction. So is not, am not, or am not becomes are not, um, was not, were not, have not, so on. So this can also be written um, when you're writing a sentence, you can either add the word not, or you can add it in as a contraction. So he is going to the park will become, he is not going to the park or he isn't going to the park. So you can either use is not to make it a negative or isn't in the contraction form. 
we will go to the bas we will go to basketball practice. We will not go to basketball practice, or we won't go to basketball practice. So other ways to make a sentence into a negative is by adding other words that have that same kind of meaning. So words like never or no one or nothing. So I can say we never go to the zoo on Fridays because it's very crowded or no one is home right now or there is nothing in the box. So all of those different forms of no um, or those different negatives are can be added to a sentence to change the meaning and turn it into a negative. Now, we do not use two negatives in the same sentence. That is grammatically incorrect. So if you see a sentence that has two negatives, you can correct it one of two ways. Either you can <clears throat> take out the extra negative, pull it out of the sentence, or you can make one of the negative words into, the, into a positive form. So what does that mean? So if I'm going to remove an extra negative, I may have a sentence that says, I do not know nothing about ocean animals. So not and nothing are two negatives that are in my sentence. So I don't want to have two of them because that makes my sentence incorrect. I'm going to remove the word nothing. And I can say, I do not know about ocean animals. Or I can change it into a positive and I can say, I do not know anything about ocean animals if I wanted to do it that way. I can also say, there isn't no one here. That's incorrect because isn't has not in it and no one is also another negative. So instead of saying there isn't no one here, I can say there is no one here. So I took the not away from my isn't, right? I broke apart that contraction and I can say there is no one here. So that way now there's only one negative in my sentence. And the reason there's one negative is I replaced isn't with is. I turned that negative into a positive. Next, we're going to talk about prefixes. Some of them that you saw in your spelling words like miss, un, and dis. So miss means wrongly. So misspelled, misunderstand, misplaced, misstep. It means you did that thing in the wrong way. Un or dis both mean either not or the opposite of, like unhappy, uncommon, uncovered, discouraged, disappoint. Now we have some Latin and Greek prefixes as well that we're going to focus on. So one of the prefixes we're going to talk about is non, which means not. So non fat means it's something that does not have fat in it. Something that is nonsense doesn't make sense. Pre is found in both Greek and Latin. And it means before. So preview, pre-cook, preheat, like you preheat the oven before you bake cookies. And then some specifically Greek suffixes like hydro or hydro, which means water. So if you're dehydrated, that means you don't have enough water in your body. Something that uses hydropower is powered by water. We have the word, or sorry, the root mega, which means large, like megabytes or megawatts. And we have the root geo, which means earth, so geothermal. So we're talking about the, the heat in the earth or geography, which is the study of the earth. So that takes us to the end of our notes for this week. We're going to go ahead and jump into our literature anthology, and we're going to be reading a story, which is a narrative nonfiction uh, that is called Energy Island. Now, a narrative nonfiction is a narrative story, just like what the ones that you guys are working on, where you're telling a story about something that happened to you or something that you were present for. And it's nonfiction, which means it really happened. Genre. Narrative nonfiction. Essential question. How have our energy resources changed over the years? Read how a community came to use renewable energy resources. Energy Island. How One Community Harnessed the Wind and Changed Their World by Alan Drummond Welcome to Energy Island. The real name of our island is Somso, but we like to call it Energy Island. Not too long ago, we were just ordinary people living on an ordinary island in the middle of Denmark. In many ways, Somso was, and still is, not very different from where you live. We have lots of fields and farms, where farmers raise cows and sheep and grow crops like potatoes, peas, corn, and strawberries. And there is a harbor where the ferry and fishing boats come in. 
Our little home has recently become quite famous, and scientists travel from all over the world just to talk to us and learn about what we've done. Why is that? Well, it's an interesting story. Let's go. Hold on to your hats. Our island is in the middle of Denmark, and it's in the middle of the sea. That's why it's always very windy here. Oops. In the summer, we have fun at the beach, and in the winter, we play games inside. We have villages and schools. Kids play soccer, and grown-ups go to the grocery store. It's very ordinary here, apart from the wind. The way we used to use energy was very ordinary too. On dark winter nights, we switched on lots of lights and turned up our heaters to keep warm. We used hot water without even thinking. Our oil arrived by tanker ship and truck, and we used it to fill up our cars and our heating systems. And our electricity came from the mainland by cable under the sea. A few years ago, most of us didn't think about where our energy came from or how it was made. That was before our island won a very unusual competition. The Danish Ministry of Environment and Energy chose Samso as the ideal place in Denmark. To become independent of non-renewable energy, a teacher named Soren Hermansen was selected to lead the energy independence project. He was a very ordinary person too. Renewable energy. Renewable energy comes from resources that will never run out or that can be replaced. For example, wind is a renewable resource since the wind will always blow. Windmills were invented to catch that energy. Rivers keep flowing all year, so they are also a source of renewable energy. People have been using dams, water mills, and other means of harnessing water power for thousands of years. Sunlight, which can be converted into solar power, is another example of a renewable resource, and so are the plants and trees that can be harvested and converted into biofuels and then replanted. Scientists are even figuring out. How to create energy from burning garbage and human sewage? Stop and check. Ask and answer questions. What are some examples of renewable energy? Okay, he did play bass guitar in a band, but his favorite subject was environmental studies, and he was very excited about energy independence. Tell me, class. What are some ways we could make our own energy right here on the island? Ride bicycles instead of driving cars. Capture heat from the sun. Use oil from crops. Burn straw and wood. Imagine if we really could make enough energy from the sun, and our crops, and even our own legs to power up the whole island. Then we wouldn't need the oil tankers to come here. We wouldn't have to worry about all the world's oil running out, and we wouldn't need electricity to be sent from the mainland. Renewable resources are so much cleaner, and think of the money we'd save. We just need to think big. But do you think we can really create that much energy ourselves? Asked Naja. From just the sun, our crops, and our legs? Well, you know, said Catherine, if there's one thing our island has plenty of. It's wind. Maybe we should start with wind energy. That's a wonderful idea," said Mr. Hermanson. "Who's with me? Hold on to your hats," we all said. The problem of non-renewable energy. Coal, oil, and natural gas are amazing sources of energy. They have helped create the modern world we live in, full of cars, plastic, and electricity. But that progress has come at a price. And that price is CO2. Carbon dioxide, CO2, is a gas produced as waste when fossil fuels are burned for energy. CO2 does occur naturally. In fact, you make some every time you breathe. But when we produce very large amounts of CO2, as we do when we use fossil fuels, it can become a serious problem for the world. When gases such as water vapor, methane, ozone. And carbon dioxide are released into the Earth's atmosphere. They trap heat. When heat is trapped inside the atmosphere, this is called the greenhouse effect. 
When the average temperature of the planet increases over time due to the greenhouse effect, it is called global warming. Global warming is a type of climate change. We kids were very excited about all the new ideas, but as for the grown-ups, well, it took them a while to catch on. It will cost millions, said Jorgen Tronberg. All these cows keep me busy enough already. Heat from the sun, said Peter Poulin. Why would we bother with that? As long as I can keep my house warm and watch TV, I'm happy. I don't need change. Bicycles, said Mogan Smaller. No way. I love my truck. Why us, said Dorothy Knudsen. Let some other island take on the challenge. Renewable energy, said Jens Hansen. I'm too old for all that. Somso is just an ordinary place, said Ole Jorgensen. What difference can we make to the world? Energy independence? In your dreams, said Petra Peterson. Global warming. Global warming can have serious consequences for all living things. Scientists predict that in the coming years, summers will become hotter, winters will become colder, and storms will be fiercer. Many scientists also believe that global warming is causing the ice caps at the North and South Poles to slowly melt away, which changes the level of water in the ocean and affects animals like polar bears and penguins, not to mention people living on the coastlines all over the world. That's one of the reasons why scientists are making such an effort to use less and less non-renewable energy. One way to do this is to use more renewable energy, which usually releases less CO2. But scientists can't do it alone. Today we should all be thinking about the problem of non-renewable energy, just like the islanders of Somso. But Soren Hermansen wouldn't give up. He called lots of local meetings. There's energy all around us, he told the islanders. We just need to work together and think big to make the best use of it. He talked to everyone. The soccer team, the farmers at the market, all the teachers, the police, the fishermen, the harbor master, the lighthouse keeper, the dentist. Teach the children to do it. What if I built a small wind turbine for my family? We're just a little island. How can we make a difference? Brian, don't talk about small. You've got to think big. This went on for several years. People listened, and lots of them even agreed with what Soren Hermansen was saying. But nothing happened. Was anyone willing to make a change? Then one day, the electrician, Brian Kudger, called Soren Hermansen. I'm thinking small, he said. I'd like to put up a second-hand wind turbine next to my house. Jorgen Tronberg was thinking big. I want a huge wind turbine. I'll invest my money and then sell the electricity it makes. Mr. Hermansen was excited. Two renewable energy projects had begun, one very small and one very big. Brian Kudger called on his family and friends to help him put up his wind turbine. While it took a big ship, some giant trucks, and two enormous cranes to build Jorgen Tronbergs. The project on Samso had begun, but we were still using a lot of non-renewable energy. It looked like we might never achieve our dream. Until one dark winter night. Sleet and snow blasted across the island. Suddenly, all the electricity on the entire island went out. Everything was dark. Everything, that is, except Brian Kudger's house. Free electricity, shouted Mr. Kudger. My turbine works. Tonight I'm energy independent. Sure enough, the blades on Mr. Kudger's new turbine were whooshing and whirling in the wind. Hold on to your hats, cried Soren Hermansen. Stop and check. Ask and answer questions. Why is this snowstorm in Somso significant to the community? News travels fast 
on a small island like Samso. After that night, everyone was asking how they could make energy of their own. Suddenly, Soren Hermansen was busier than ever, helping people start new energy projects. The whole island got to work. Some people had big ideas. Some people had small ones. But all of them were important in working toward our goal. The Holm family installed solar panels on their farm. Today their sheep are munching grass while the panels soak up energy from the sun. Ingvar Jorgensen built a biomass furnace. It burns straw instead of oil, and now heats his house and his neighbors' houses too. In fact, biomass is so big on Samso that whole villages are now heated by burning wood and straw grown on the island. Eric Anderson makes tractor fuel oil from his canola crop, and Brian Kudjer's wife, Bettina, whizzes around in an electric car. Their windmill powers the batteries. Today we even have electric bicycles, charged by the power of the wind. Every one of us has an energy independent story. And that's why people all over the world want to hear the latest news from Energy Island. Let's see if Jorgen Tronberg will take us up the ladder to the very top of his fantastic wind turbine so we can see what SAMSO looks like today, wind energy. Windmills were first invented over 1,000 years ago in the land that is now Iran. Back then, the windmills were used to grind corn and pump water. It's a strange coincidence that today, Iran is a place where huge amounts of oil, a fossil fuel, are drilled from the ground and shipped all over the world. Windmills are still used in the modern world, and they can do lots more than grind corn. The wind turbine, a modern type of windmill, actually makes electric power. When wind blows across a wind turbine's blade, the blade turns and causes the main shaft to spin a generator, which makes electric power. The more wind there is outside, the faster the blades turn and the more energy the turbine makes. Before a turbine is built, scientists take measurements to discover which places are the windiest. Today there are turbines on hills, on top of city buildings, and even in the ocean. The electricity that is created by wind turbines can be used to power a single home or building, or it can be connected to an energy grid where the electricity is shared by a whole community. As you can see, there's plenty going on. Now we have lots of wind turbines. Down there is SAMSO's brand new learning center, the Energy Academy, where kids and grown-ups from all over the world come to learn about what we've achieved and to talk about new ideas for creating, sharing, and saving energy. Guess who the director of the Academy is? An extraordinary teacher named Soren Hermansen. Energy in the world. The more fossil fuel a country uses, the more CO2 it produces. The United States produces nearly 6 billion metric tons of CO2 per year. That weighs more than 800 million elephants. As countries across the world become more developed and use more energy, they produce ever-increasing amounts of CO2. Global warming is becoming a more frightening prospect every single day. But there is good news. In this modern world, we are able to share ideas and work together much more easily than ever before. Scientists are working on incredible new ways to use renewable resources and to save energy. Some places are windy, some are sunny, some are hot, and some are cold. Each country or community must look at what special resources it has available so as not to be dependent on non-renewable resources in the future. The SAMSO Energy Academy is a place where people of all ages can share ideas about energy and how it is made and used. Things have certainly changed on our little island in the past few years. We no longer need the oil tankers to bring us oil, and we don't need electricity from the mainland. In fact, on very windy days, we have so much power that we send our own electricity back through the cable under the sea for other people in Denmark to use. Samso may be a small island, but we have made a difference in the world, reducing our carbon emissions 
by 140% in just 10 years. And we did it by working together, saving energy. One thing that will take a lot of pressure off our need for energy, both renewable and non-renewable, is simply making an effort to save energy. We waste huge amounts of power to keep warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Badly designed doors, windows, and walls mean our heating and cooling systems work harder than they should and produce too much CO2. Building more efficient heaters and coolers, along with more efficiently designed buildings, would greatly help us cut down on the problems of global warming. We can also save fuel by building new cars, trucks, and machines that waste less energy. Taking a bus or a train is another great way to cut down on energy use, and riding your bike is even better. To save energy, we need to think about how we use it every day. So that's how we got the name Energy Island. And what can you do to make a difference on your island? What's that? You say you don't live on an island? Well, maybe you think you don't live on an island, but actually you do. We all do. We're all islanders on the biggest island of them all, planet Earth. So it's up to us to figure out how to save it. There's renewable energy all around us. We just need to work together to make the best use of it. Hold on to your hats. Okay, that takes us to the end of our first story. We're going to jump into our next one, which is um, a myth from Greek mythology. And you're going to see some words in here that are going to show up additionally in your assignment where you're going to have a section um, in your practice book that deals with words from Greek mythology and it already has a definition for them in your book. So those were not added into our notes because the, the words and their meanings or those roots and their meanings are already in your assignment. So let's go ahead and read through this story called A Fire and Water. Genre. Myth. Compare texts. Read about the role of resources in Greek mythology. Of fire and water. In ancient times, people used myths to explain our world. The following myths give us a glimpse into how the ancient Greeks viewed two vital renewable resources, fire and water. The Gift of Fire Long ago, trouble arose on Mount Olympus, where the Greek gods lived. Zeus, the ruler of the gods, became enraged with Prometheus, a titan. After creating humans out of clay, Prometheus provided them with three gifts that Zeus wanted to reserve only for the gods. Knowledge, bestowed on Prometheus by Athena, the ability to stand upright, and the potential to be noble. With these gifts, humans could outsmart animals and could hunt for food, clothing, and shelter. To appease the angry Zeus, humans offered him abundant sacrifices. They kept little for themselves. Prometheus thought this was wrong. He tricked Zeus into choosing a cleverly disguised sacrificial dish rather than a richer dish for his offering. The dish Zeus chose looked delicious on the outside, but within it consisted entirely of fat and bones. When Zeus realized the trick, he took fire away from humans. Prometheus pleaded with Zeus to change his mind, but Zeus forbade him to bring fire to humans. Prometheus watched his creations eat raw meat and shiver in the cold and dark. Finally, he went to Athena for help, and she led Prometheus to a hidden entrance to Mount Olympus where he could capture fire for humans. As the chariot of the sun god Helios passed by, Prometheus stole a spark and hid it in a fennel stalk. He snuck away and gave people fire. Fury consumed Zeus when he learned what Prometheus had done. Zeus ordered the titan to be chained to a rock. Each day, an eagle pecked at Prometheus's liver. Each night, the liver grew back. For generations, Prometheus suffered. At last, the hero Heracles freed him from this torment by shooting a poisoned arrow at the eagle. From then on, as a reminder of his punishment, Zeus made Prometheus wear around his finger a piece of the rock to which he had been chained. Ever since, 
humans have worn rings as a symbol of their gratitude for the gift of fire. Water versus Wisdom While Zeus ruled the world from high on Mount Olympus, his brother Poseidon ruled the seas. Athena had upset Zeus, her father, by helping Prometheus. Now she dared to contest with her uncle, Poseidon, about who would rule over the Acropolis of Attica. Attica's king, Cecrops, was half man and half serpent. He agreed to judge the contest between Athena, goddess of wisdom, and Poseidon, god of the waters. The winner would be honored with temples and would have the city named after him or her. Each was asked to offer one special gift that would serve the people of the city. Poseidon was the first to offer a gift. Raising his trident high over his head, he struck the rocky hill with a powerful blow. Cecrops watched in amazement as the hole filled with water. In the hot, dry land of Greece, water was a precious resource. The people of Attica were impressed. They seemed ready to rule in favor of Poseidon until Athena told Cecrops to taste the water. A servant brought a cup to the king, who drank it and spit it out. It was salt water. There was no use for that in Attica. Then, Athena came forward with the branch of a tree that no human had seen before. She planted the branch in the ground, and an olive tree sprang up in its place. The king nodded, pleased. His people now had a source of food, wood, and oil. The leaves of the tree suggested a peaceful world. Cecrops selected Athena as the main goddess of the city and named it Athens in her honor. Poseidon was outraged that his gift had not been accepted. As he returned to the sea, he cursed Athens and promised that the city would never have enough water. From that time on, drought has troubled Athens, the capital of Greece. Make Connections What role do fire and water play in these two myths? How has our understanding of resources changed since ancient times? Okay, that takes us to the end of our literature anthology. We're going to jump into our reading and writing workshop, and we're going to be reading another narrative nonfiction, and this one is called The Great Energy Debate. Genre, narrative nonfiction, The Great Energy Debate. Essential question. How have our energy resources changed over the years? Read about a classroom debate over energy resources. Our energy debate will be an incredible event, but I need to study. Our teacher won't tell us which side of the debate we'll be on until the day before it happens, which means we'll have to pre-plan arguments for both sides. The debate will be next Tuesday and will include a discussion about different energy sources. Each team will have a microphone. One team will talk about the benefits of an energy source, and the other team will talk about its drawbacks. We'll have to learn about the environmental consequences related to each resource as well as the costs. We may be asked to debate the future of gasoline as an energy source. If so, I would say that gasoline is made from oil, a fossil fuel. According to geologists, fossil fuels formed over hundreds of millions of years from ancient plant and animal remains. But here's the problem. We use these fuels far faster than it takes them to form. Because fossil fuels are non-renewable resources, if we keep using them, eventually there will be none left. Plus, burning these fuels pollutes the air. It is easy to be hypercritical of fossil fuels. However, most of our cars and factories use this type of fuel. And therefore, changing everything would be a huge undertaking. What is energy? Energy is the ability to do work or make a change. It also is a source of power for making electricity or doing mechanical work. 
We use the wind, the sun, fossil fuels, and biofuels to produce energy. Burning coal produces heat energy that is converted into electrical energy. We use that energy to light our houses. Solar energy comes from the sun. Solar panels convert sunlight into electrical energy. If we are asked to debate the use of wind energy, we would have to know that this is a renewable energy source. For example, unlike fossil fuels, wind will never run out. One large wind turbine could produce enough energy for a whole city. In addition, this method doesn't damage the environment. Turbines can be placed all over the world to capture wind energy. Then the energy from the turbines is converted into electrical energy. But there is a drawback. Wind may not be as efficient as other energy sources. Only about 30 or 40 percent of all wind energy is changed into electricity. It would be very expensive to have wind turbines installed all over the world. This debate is important for people in the United States. Our country makes up only about 5% of the entire world's population, yet we consume about 30% of the world's energy. It is not a coincidence that students are asked to take part in these debates. We will probably have to make these decisions when we are adults. The debate will be difficult, but I will be ready. Make Connections how might our dependence on fossil fuels change in the future? What can you do to help save energy resources? Ask and answer questions. When you read an informational text, you may come across new information. Asking questions about the text and reading to find the answer can help you to understand new information. As you read The Great Energy Debate, ask and answer questions about the text. Find text evidence. When you first read The Great Energy Debate, you may have asked yourself why the narrator said on page 411 that the students had to pre-plan arguments for both sides. Our energy debate will be an incredible event, but I need to study. Our teacher won't tell us which side of the debate we'll be on until the day before it happens, which means we'll have to pre-plan arguments for both sides. The debate will be next Tuesday and will include a discussion about different energy sources. Each team will have a microphone. Our team will talk about the benefits of an energy source and the other team will talk about its drawbacks. We'll have to learn about the environmental consequences related to each resource as well as the costs. The text says the teacher wouldn't tell which side of the issue students would be debating. Therefore, I inferred that the students had to study pros and cons for each side. Main Idea and Key Details the main idea is the most important idea or point that an author makes in a paragraph or section of text. Key details give important information to support the main idea. Find text evidence. When I reread the first paragraph of The Great Energy Debate on page 412, I can identify the key details. Next, I can think about what those details have in common. Then I can figure out the main idea of the section. Graphic Organizer Main Idea If we keep using fossil fuels, eventually there will be none left. Detail Fossil fuels take hundreds of millions of years to form. Detail We use fossil fuels faster than it takes them to form. Detail Fossil fuels are non-renewable resources. Caption. The key details tell about the main idea.
Narrative Nonfiction The great energy debate is narrative nonfiction. Narrative nonfiction tells a story, presents facts and information about a topic, includes text features. Find text evidence. I can tell that the great energy debate is narrative nonfiction. It tells a story about students preparing for a debate while providing facts about energy sources. It also has text features. Text features, sidebars. Sidebars provide more information to help explain the topic. Sidebars are read after the main part of the text. Latin and Greek prefixes. A prefix is a word part added to the front of a word to change its meaning. Some prefixes come from Latin, such as non equals not, pre equals before. Other prefixes come from Greek, such as hyper equals excessively, bio equals life. Find text evidence. In the great energy debate, I see the word biofuels on page 412. Bio is a Greek prefix that means life. So biofuels are right, fuels that come from that living things. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I hope you have an amazing We use day. the wind, the sun.